to 105.1 Life FM. Bendigo's Positive Choice here on the Sunday afternoon right on 3.30. Today ready for another episode. Here's Ruth Webb from Tabernacle of David. And uh, Ruth, welcome once again to our show and to your show and looking forward to it. And uh, that line is really just set to, to pounce by the sound of thing as he it overlooks yes. Israel. Amen. Amen. So, so before we get into that, I just... Today we want to look at the perversion that's in culture, compare that with the holiness of God. Mm. And that's a really important thing for us to look at. Um, because this week there's some legislation passing in the Victorian Parliament that we really need to take notice of. But um, a Middle East update from what we shared a couple of weeks ago when you shared that vision about the line of Judah sitting over... Um, watching Jerusalem and um, there's been a lot of activity happening in um, in Israel or the Middle East actually in the last week and um, so your vision was that the line of Judah was watching watching ready not doing anything just watching as if something was about to mm. happen so this is what's happening at the minute um, last weekend there was B-52 bombers seen over the area from America, which was said to deter aggression and reassure the Allies. A few days ago, Secretary of State Mike, Mike Pompeo was in Israel. The next day, Pompeo flew to Saudi Arabia, as did Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu and the head of Mossad. So this was a groundbreaking Ooh. meeting. It's never happened before. And now the US Defence Minister is in the Middle East. And there's also been photos available of many Iranian Navy ships in the Gulf, like an armada of them. And yesterday, the most senior nuclear scientist of Iran was assassinated. Now, the reason for the flurry of activity is the concern about Iran, particularly if Biden was to become president, because he said he would rejoin the Iran deal. And Iran has 12 times enriched uranium as allowed by the Atomic Agency. And they're just a few months away from being able to produce a bomb. So the guy that was assassinated is the head guy who, they said without him, it comes to a halt. And um, so the Iranians have been keeping a low profile because they're hoping that Biden will become president. Um, but there's concerns that Donald Trump might on the Iranian nuclear facilities before the inauguration, so whoever, of course, mm. wins all the court cases. So the line of Judah is watching, waiting. And so I just thought, we're going to pray for Israel before we do anything else today mm. Mm. because, um, you know, he's had us on alert since you had that vision. And um, now seeing all this activity, that just makes sense in it. So, Father, we today just come before you and thank you that you are the line of Judah that your eye is upon Israel at this moment. And so, Lord, we just stand in agreement with your word that you'll place watchmen all around the borders of Israel. And I pray, Lord, for the leaders of the Middle East, whether they be from the Arab countries or from Israel or from the United States, we pray for the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. And, Lord, we just thank you that your eye is upon Jerusalem, your eye is upon Israel. And that nothing will happen for that nation that is not allowed by you. So, Lord, we just come into agreement with your word today Amen. for Israel. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So that was an important update. So last week we talked about um, singing the song Day and Night, Night and Day, Let Incense Arise. We talked about what the incense is about and it's about brokenness. So today, one of the favourite songs we have is Holy, 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 and I think that was playing just a few minutes ago, and we're going to play it again. But the authenticity of playing songs like that or singing songs like that is the command to be holy as he is holy and to worship in the beauty of holiness. And so I just want to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 18. It says, Prepare your hearts and minds for action. Stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvellous grace that is coming to you. For when Jesus Christ is unveiled, a greater measure of grace will be released to you. As God's obedient children, never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you didn't know better. 
Instead, shape your lives to become like the Holy One who called you. For Scripture says you are to be holy because I am holy. Since you call on him as your heavenly father, the impartial judge who judges according to each one's works, live each day with holy awe and reverence throughout your time on earth. For you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life handed down from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold which eventually perishes, but the precious blood of Christ, who like a spotless, unblemished lamb was sacrificed for us and so in this track that we did in i think back in 2009 on this the hymn holy 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 i also speak about us having a fresh revelation of god especially of his holiness because i believe that we really need to have that in this day Creator, your Maker, your Savior, your King, your Husband. I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Releasing the sounds of heaven. Declare 
today that the sounds of heaven be released. from our album Holy One. God chose to make his holy name known to the world, first of all through the nation of Israel and second through his church made up of both Jew and Gentile. And in this song I spoke about the vision of John seeing Jesus in all his holiness and glory, which is the fullness of who Yeshua is. Isaiah also had a vision of the holiness of God that changed his life and I believe we need a vision of that, a revelation of that in these dark days. So I ask the question, and you might ask the question, what is holiness? Because it's often misunderstood. It's probably one of the most misunderstood attributes of God. In 1 Peter 2.9, there's a quote which comes from Exodus 19, when God appeared to Israel on Mount Sinai, and he called Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation to God. They would be different to other nations. They would belong to Yahweh and be distinct from other nations. 
who served other gods. So now to the church, both Jew and Gentile followers of Jesus, in 1 Peter 2.9, he says, You are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvellous light, and now he claims you as his very own. And in that, he, in these scriptures in 1 Peter 1 and 2, he says, Be holy as I am holy. So he's really referring back to uh, Mount Sinai. So what do these mean, words mean? So in Greek, the word is hagios, which means to be clean, innocent, pure, chaste, morally blameless, physically or ceremoniously pure. In Hebrew, the word is kadosh. Mm. And the next song we're going to sing is uh, to play today is actually called kadosh. So that's the Hebrew word for holy. And in Hebrew, the word means to be separated for God, to be dedicated, to be clean, purify, something special. Um, often we use the word to sanctify. And um, when you think of something that's special, I have a beautiful Royal Albert dinnerware set. And I bring it out for special occasions. I don't use it every day in the kitchen because it's too valuable. And so in that sense, holiness is like a people, a person set apart for a mm. particular purpose. It's like um, it's special, but it's it's you look after it in a very special way. And so... Um, it's, and the other reason, one of the other reasons it's it's one of the most difficult attributes to understand uh, is God's holiness, is first of all, we confuse holiness with legalism. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, so we say, well, if we do certain things, attain certain behavior, then we're holy. And that's not it. But, but that confusion um, really mm. messes us up. But the second reason is that we can understand God is love because even though our love is, you know, a little bit, um, well, it's not perfect, but we do experience love and we can sort of understand it even though it's not perfect. But holiness, Jesus is the only one that's holy, who's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're broken vessels, basically, have been redeemed. And so... To understand that you can, it's very difficult. And the only way that you can really get an understanding of holiness is to look at Jesus and to keep our eyes on Him. Because if we look at each other, um, we're going to really misunderstand holiness. Mm. But to look at Jesus, He's the author and the finisher of our faith, and it's only His pure, holy blood that can redeem us. And so it always brings us back to the power of His blood. And First Peter 1 says, you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life handed down from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold, which perishes, but the precious blood of Messiah, who like a spotless, unblemished lamb was sacrificed for us. So Jesus is the priceless treasure. His blood is the priceless treasure and our example of purity and holiness. And so First Peter 2 says, so keep coming to him. He's the living stone. He's the one who's holy. Keep coming to him. And so this is a real encouragement to us as we see such perversion in society to keep coming to him because he is the only one who is holy. Mm. So when he says, be holy as I am holy, we have to keep looking at him or else we don't understand what holiness is. And that's, that's really important. Keep coming to him who is the living stone. Though he was rejected and discarded by men, but chosen by God and priceless in God's sight. As believers, you know this great worth, his preciousness is imparted to you. So the preciousness of his purity is imparted to us. And it's receiving that. Um, we often don't realize or grasp the significance of that Um I, I see it. So the pure blood of Jesus is the only basis of our salvation, our acceptance of the Father, and his preciousness is imparted to us. And so as we just contemplate about what holiness is, it is who God is, but it's the precious, pure blood of Jesus. No sin in him at all. No darkness in him. No, uh, he's just perfect truth. No lies. No deception. No darkness, no, not even a shadow of turning, no unfaithfulness. 
um, all these things that, you know, we know for us, you know, we may, we may strive towards that, but we don't achieve it in its fullness. And so as we listen to Karen Davis singing um, Kadosh of the album Adonai, just remember that means holy, holy, holy. Powerful rendition of Kadosh, Kadosh of Karen Davis's. And that intro and even the ending is a reminding that it's like the fearfulness of the holiness of God. You can't muck around with him. And I often talk about it's like the nature of God is holy. He, that's who he is. Mm. And for us as humans, it's like people say, oh, well, that's he's angry. And I go, no, that's who he is. He's holy. We're like a um, a flight, you know, a match, and a match to a f uh, sorry, sorry, like a piece of paper, and a match to a piece of paper just burns it. That's mm, that's its flame, nature yeah. because mm. a, a flame to piece of paper just burns it. Mm. It's not a matter of love or hate. It's it's just the nature of it, and the nature of God is so holy that our own holiness, and that's why we need the blood of Jesus between us. But um, the thing is that the confusion between holiness or legalism, I just want to go there in this little segment, because in Mount Sinai, Israel was called to be a holy nation, and within that context, they're given the Ten Commandments. Mm. All right, so suddenly there's laws or behavior mm. um, things that's given. Now, in Corinthians, in Hebrews 12 and in First Peter, the church is called the holiness, and there's several passages there. And it also starts to speak about behavior. And so we can think that it's behavior that makes us holy, um, but that's not true. And I just want to share a little personal experience. In 1993, I released my first book, Restoring True Worship, and it was subtitled Music, Holiness and Revival. And... I'd walked through some fiery trials and really had an encounter with his holiness because the Lord convicted me of idolatry within the church, mm. of my own mm -hmm. self within my heart, and also of music itself. And so I had to deal with a whole lot of things. And I didn't want to write the book. I said, God, I'm not a theologian, and etc., etc. But I was addressing my experience with God and what he was saying to me in that and in the call to the church out of that. And so where I addressed issues within the book about the call to holiness, I was not saying, do this, this, this and this, and you will be holy. Rather, it was more like, if you love God as, you know, the first love and want mm -hmm. intimacy mm -hmm. with him, there are some things you'll need to deal with and you won't want to do. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, the cleansing of our mouth, the cleansing of the things we watch, the cleansing of the, because, you know, it will offend the lover of your soul. And so... But I soon found out the hard way that many Christians and a lot of pastors actually confused the word holiness with legalism. And I was attacked for preaching legalism. And I soon discovered that I, it, it shocked me because I had no idea that, you know, there was that confusion. And so depending upon the era you live in, the idea of legalism can say different things. Um, a long time ago, when I was growing up, it was... If you're going to be holy, you can't go to the cinema. Mm. Um, or you can't, women, you can't wear lipstick. And there was one even further back that said you can't buy a washing machine. <laughs> and so, you know, there's things like that we would look at, but there's certain things where it says, you know, avoid the appearance of evil. But in today's culture, so, you know, we were just chatting about this off air and it's like, uh, what about being politically correct mm. or the language we use um, as the language keeps changing or don't judge people, be inclusive. Um, in a world where there's a lot of lawlessness, it's um, the interesting thing. And so we, we look at legalism as trying to have a right relationship or the right standing with God by doing certain things, by fulfilling a law. But righteousness is having a right standing or relationship with God purely based on the blood of Jesus and mm. our faith in him. And that's really a very important distinction. But behaviour comes out of that. And we'll mm. talk about that in a moment. But um, behaviour comes out of how he changes us. But how are we made holy? Well, um, we are set apart to God. And there's four basic things that I just want to share from the scripture. It's one Hebrews 2, 11 says, Jesus, the Holy One, makes us holy. 
That's simple. Jesus makes us holy. And in 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, it says, We were ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus, who, like a spotless, unblemished lamb, was sacrificed for us. His preciousness is imparted to you. So that it's his blood that makes us holy. Number three, the prayer of Jesus before his betrayal in John 17 says, Your word is truth. And he prayed, Make them holy by the truth. So the word of God, the truth of the word, makes us holy. And as another scripture says, all washed by the water of the word. So there's that cleansing mm -hmm. made holy by his word. And the fourth one is probably our least favorite of all. Um, because in Hebrews 12, it says this method of holiness is his discipline. Mm. And um, of course, we go, oh, don't like that one. But it says in Hebrews 12, Verse 5 to 6, my child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. So he, gave, he says, who he loves, he disciplines. Who he loves much, he really disciplines. And it says, fully embrace God's correction as part of your training. For he is doing what any loving father does for his children. So those of us that are parents, we know the importance of discipline mm. so that our children won't run on the road and be hurt or whatever. And it says, our parents corrected us for the short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them. But God corrects us throughout our whole life for our own good, giving us an invitation to share his holiness or so we can become holy like him. So it's interesting in Hebrews, it, it actually links the discipline of God to entering into holiness. Mm. So that's a really, that's a good way to look at his disciplines. One, it's his love. But two, it's because it's a way to share in his holiness. And so um, that's, a, that's a really, really interesting way to, to perceive of holiness rather than I've got to do all these rules. He's lovingly correcting us to say, not that way. And if you think of the Ten Commandments, we often think, oh, they're, they're a negative thing. But God, the loving Father, knows if you do those things, you're going to get hurt. Like, you know, we as to our children when they were little, if you run on the road, you're going to get hurt. It's not because well, I hate you. I love you so much. I don't want you to run on that road because it's not going to end well. Mm. And the Ten Commandments are like that. It's like if you do those things, it's, life is not going to turn out well for you. And the loving Father says, I want you to know if you, if you avoid those things, life will go well. And so to me, that's a better way of looking at it. That's mm -hmm. the positive way of seeing Father's love. And it's interesting, the holiness of God is the only attribute that's sung about in heaven. And so you hear the, um, it, it speaks in the book of Revelation of both the four creatures around the throne, the elders and the angels singing, holy, holy, holy. 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 Yeah. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit are holy. You don't hear them singing love, love, love. You don't hear them singing of the other attributes of God, but you do hear them singing holy, holy. Holy. And so this is a very important attribute that we need to really grasp hold of. So we're going to listen to the um, song that Terry McKelman wrote, beautiful song. And uh, I call it Hear the Sound of Heaven. And we recorded it on our Holy One album where he had a vision of, of this worship in heaven, of them actually singing holy, holy, holy. There is none like him. He is holy. It's interesting. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord and it changed him. He saw the throne room of God. He saw the um, the angels singing. He actually saw the, the doorposts shaking at the response to the angels singing, holy, holy, mm. holy. And suddenly he realized his, the condition of his mouth. Interesting, we were talking about off air about the mouth that, you know, even many Christians just speak um, all sorts of things. And Isaiah had a real conviction of, of his, uh, the condition of his mouth and not only his mouth, but that of, of the culture around him. And the, the angel flew 
took a coal off the altar and cleansed his mouth. And the thing from that is that as we have a vision of the holiness of God, that's when we really understand our own hearts. Um, you know, we can, if without that, we can look at ourselves and go, oh, yeah, we're fine because we compare ourselves with others. But when we compare ourselves with the holiness of God, then we realize how far fall we short. Mm. And also the culture around us. And so that's when Isaiah responded to the call of God. And so that's all very, um, very important. And that's why I believe we need a refreshing of knowing he is the Holy One of Israel. In this society that we live in right now, we really need a new revelation. As I said on Mount Sinai and in the New Testament, when holiness was spoken about, it, it was in the context, it then went on to about character. And the thing is, when we're made new creations in Christ, it should change our behaviour. We do change. Ooh. Our hearts change and our behaviour changes. And even if we really submitted to the Lord, our mouths would change. And, um, you know, we can probably all um, reflect and think about what changed in my life when I came to the Lord. And because forgiveness of sin changes us, and in 2 Corinthians 6, it says we've proved, Paul said to the Corinthian church, we've proved ourselves by our lifestyle of purity. And he named patience and kindness, and he says, by the spirit of holiness. So there's the, you know, and, and the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit for good reason. It's the spirit of holiness. So behavior can actually be like a fruit test, you know, the fruit inspection. What's the fruit? And if there's bad fruit, it's like what needs attention? And so holiness is not produced by following rules or by good behavior, but it can be a fruit or a sign of where we've allowed the blood of Jesus to work in our hearts. So in that sense, it, it can be a, a fruit test. And one of the big fruit issues that show up uh, regarding holiness is immorality. Mm -hmm. It's um, because holiness is about purity and being separated to God and in the same way, sexual purity is about being separated to your spouse, which because it's ordained by God and is beautiful. And Ephesians 5 talks about the picture of marriage and the relationship with God. Mm. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, Paul says the body was not created for illicit sex, but to serve and worship the Lord Jesus. Paul speaks to the Corinthian church quite severely about immorality. And I would suggest it's a good message to our culture as well. Mm -hmm. Um, especially since the sexual revolution of the 60s. The Corinthian church, the culture was very debased. The idolatry was based on the Greek gods, the giants, and all the, all the stuff to do with that. It was strong in the society, but, and it had a perversion with it, a lot of immorality, um, including pedophilia amongst elites. And it impacted the church. So people came to Jesus, new converts came to the Lord, but they decided they'd like to keep their immoral lifestyle as well. And so Paul's writings in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, especially the sixth chapter in both books, is about sexual immorality and about idolatry. And particularly, you know, whether it's pagan worship, which is to do with demonic things. So I just want to read from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15 to 20. And Paul says, don't you know that your bodies belong to Christ? Should one presume to take the members of Christ's body and make them into members of a harlot? Certainly not. Aren't you aware of the fact that when anyone sleeps with a prostitute, he becomes part of her and she becomes part of him? The whole talk of you know becoming one flesh. Mm. Verse 17 says, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is mingled into one spirit with him. And so unity of spirit between God and our, our spirit and God's spirit is often the place we come to in really the purity of worship. It really is that place of that oneness that's there. So verse 18 says, This is why you must keep running away from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is external to the body, but immorality involves sinning against your own body. Have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness who lives in you? You don't belong to yourself any longer. For the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside your sanctuary. You were God's expensive purchase, paid for with tears of blood. Or in other translations, it says you were bought with a price. Mm. 
So again, you know, the holiness comes by the blood of Jesus, but it's saying our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So immor immor immorality is acts against the body, but it's like it's defiling the spirit of holiness who lives in us. So this is a really important issue um, in for the church in our culture. And idolat where idolatry is really the antithesis of true worship, immorality is one of the sins that's not only rampant in our culture, um, it's the antithesis of holiness, but it violates holiness, but it's also a problem in the church today. Tolerance of immorality um, within the church has actually quashed our authority in our culture. Um, and it's minimised our voice, even as we sing songs like Holy, Holy, mm, Holy. Yeah. So when subjects come up in, in our culture, for example, like same-sex marriage or all those sorts of issues, I sense that sometimes we've lost the debates because we haven't dealt with those issues in-house. And so I'm just going to read some uh, some statistics, get over these big words, in 2016, the magazine Christianity Today reported on a Barna Group survey of 3,000 adults, teenagers and pastors. And it said over half of the pastors and over half of the youth pastors admitted they struggled with pornography, either currently or in the past. It's very high. This is 2016. Mm -hmm. At the time of the survey, 21% of youth pastors and 14% of pastors admitted they currently struggle with using porn. Around 10% said they were addicted. 47% of men and 12% of women see, said they seek out porn at least once or twice a month. And about 30% of Christian men and 6% of Christian women actively look for porn during that time. And that article could be found on the internet of Christianity Today. There's other in, um, websites and ministries in Australia that deal with that. They say the issue is very, very high. And I know that the idea of taking God's grace and his grace is that he will forgive us, but some have extended to say, well, then I can do what I like. And so when the church is either silent or we compromise, particularly compromise and don't call to account those mm -hmm. things, it weakens our testimony and our authority. So issues like how often do you hear in the church speaking about sex before marriage? It violates the covenant and we need to deal with it. Pornography, I've just referred to, homosexuality, pedophile, bestiality, new age and occult, and other idolatries like Freemasonry, and a whole lot of other things. And generally you find where there's those um, other isms that people believe in, generally there is sexual immorality is a part of those mm -hmm. um, things. So right now, this is really important. Last week in the Victorian Parliament, they passed in the lower house what's called the conversion therapy legislation and it's due to go through the upper house this week i'm going to read from the premier's website on this legislation and it says and i quote cruel and bigoted practices that seek to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity will soon be stamped out across victoria thanks to new laws introduced to parliament today the change or suppression conversion practices prohibitation bill 2020 will put in place new measures to protect Victorians from the serious damage and trauma caused by conversion practices. Now, what that means is that parents, pastors or counsellors will not be allowed to advise young people that are struggling with their gender identity. Now, as a teacher of young people, you know that uh, teenage years are the biggest of identity confusion mm -hmm. and trying to work out who you are. And, and knowing who you are is a big issue throughout life. So sometimes they get caught in this whole thing. And it will become illegal to say there's anything wrong with sexual sin, especially about homosexuality, but also adultery, fornication. And the penalty will be two years in jail or a $10,000 fine or both. So this is a real warning to the church of not compromising, but also getting our own house in order, really mm. getting our own house in order to have authority to speak. And the only way we can is when we look at the holiness of God. 
Paul warned the Corinthian church of compromise. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 to 16, he said, How can you have union between demonic practices and coming to the table of the Lord in communion? Mm -hmm. And he said, you can't. And he lists, you know, he says it in a few different ways. And then he says, come out from among them and be separate. So that's another word for holiness. Touch nothing that is unclean and I will embrace you. And this is the Lord saying, I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters, says the Lord Yahweh Almighty. So the fatherhood of God is linked to us being separated from this. And he says, remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. So there's a very strong link between these things. Now, we have ministered to many people who have known the forgiveness of God for perversion because holiness has been a very strong revelation, not only have I had personally, but in the throne room worship, the holiness of God is pertinent. And so we have had people come in that have been um, previously involved before they've come to the Lord, involved in sexual sins and even perversion. And where they've known the forgiveness of God, they've struggled and even tormented by the shame and the guilt. Mm -hmm. And the defilement to the soul can actually cause brain damage, you know, and, and it's a conflict with holiness. And so... I simply say, and Derek Prince has got a brilliant teaching on this about shame, about appropriating the blood of Jesus and the word to cleanse the conscience that's been seared and the brain cells that have been even destroyed by, by these things. So Hebrews 10 says this, verse 14, by his one perfect sacrifice, Jesus made us perfectly holy and complete for all time. Mm. We come closer to God and approach him with an open heart, fully convinced by faith that nothing will keep us at a distance from him. For our hearts have been sprinkled with blood to remove impurity. And we've been freed from the accusing conscience of dead works. And now we're clean, unstained and presentable to God inside and out. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, By the blood of his cross, Everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent and restored to innocence again. And if there's anybody listening today that has been touched by these sins in their life, I really encourage you, especially as we go to this next song in a minute, that you allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse the shame and the guilt because it says the blood of his cross brings us back to the original intent, restored to innocence, restored to innocence. And the song we're going to play is Oh, the Blood of Jesus. And I just want to share something. I had the most powerful dream last night. I won't go into the details of it, but in the dream, I heard the song Oh, the Blood of Jesus playing in a stadium. It was a sports stadium. And a couple of people just stood to their feet as it began to play. And they stood to their feet like you would with the national anthem. This man took off his hat, placed it over his, his heart like you would with the national anthem. But the in him, as I watched this in the dream, it was like this man had experienced the power of the blood mm -hmm. in such a powerful way. And I could feel the power of the blood and I woke up singing, Oh, the blood of Jesus. So this version we're going to play is by Joshua Aaron. He's a Messianic Jewish man. And he sings it in English and in Hebrew. But I just encourage you to sing with it and to take hold of the blood of Jesus, to cleanse, to cleanse. You may have known his forgiveness, but allow his blood to touch areas of guilt and shame and all perversion and anything that's touched you and also where there's been relationship damage to bring reconciliation his blood is enough oh the blood of jesus his blood washes as white as snow so i just encourage you today as we uh finish today that 
you have a fresh vision of his holiness. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Go to Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and soak in that to get a, a real fresh vision and ask the Holy Spirit to show you who Yeshua really is, the pure, pure Son of God. His holy blood cleanses us. So we're going to go out with another song of our album, The Holy One. It's simply, holy is he.